Good job, kids. All right, we got, uh, we're going to have some extra singers for you, and uh, we're going to start off with Ralph. Okay, come on up. Sing well, I'll sing you one verse, okay? Can you stand one? Sing the whole song. Sing the whole song. Okay, I'll go fashion then. Oh, the fashion. There you go. Oh, the fashion. Oh, the fashion. When the ride crew comes in style, I'll be in fashion. But some girls, we are aware, takes more time to comb their hair than they do to say their prayer, for well, that's a fashion. But a poodle dog, they'll keep on their arm and let him sleep. If he dies, oh how they weep, for well, that's a fashion. Oh, the fashion, oh, the fashion. When the right to comes in style, I'll be in fashion. Yeah, hope nobody got fendered on that. I wouldn't hurt you for the fenders on my left hand. <laughs> I'll tell you what, aren't we thankful for our seniors here? It's always good to hear them now and then, ain't it? We, do, we really do appreciate them. All right, now we got a little new group. It's going to be Olivia and Brock. We're going to go ahead and make their way up here. Long and winding road. 
see how these times God has opened the doors no man could ever close And there's one thing I've learned Through all these years Is that God's always listening He don't miss anything So even through the tears I'll keep on praying Yeah, I'll keep on praying I'll keep on hoping I'm gonna keep hoping While I am pleading I'll be pleading I'm believing believing For the answer to come I'll keep on trusting Oh, I'll keep on trusting I'll keep on reaching Yeah, I'll keep on reaching tear to both grandmother's eyes couldn't help but watch it <laughs> no that's good good job kids all right Shelly go ahead and come on up I love you Lord Oh, your mercies never fail me All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing Of the goodness of God Of God, I love your voice. You have led me through the fire and the darkest nights. You were close like no other. I've known you as a father, I've known you as a friend, and I have lived. In the goodness of God the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my
sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With you but that song just never gets old to me does it it just gives you that joke Shelly can you go ahead and come on up here and sing that song again <laughs> uh, the, the song last week the song last week you know as Doug said the, the, the devil just wants us he just wants to steal our joy but God's here this morning. I, if you all would, could you all stand? And we're going to give the devil a black eye this morning. And we're going to give God victory. Because there's nothing our God cannot do. And I believe, I believe he's going, I believe he's going to do some miracles.
Are you thankful this morning for the blood applied? That song, I tell you, uh, it touches my heart, and Shelly does a wonderful job singing it, but I am thankful for the blood applied to my life this morning. How many of you this morning know that uh, if we decide to follow Jesus, we're going to be in a spiritual battle? You're going to be in a spiritual battle. It's not, you know... I've, I've heard all kind of preaching over my lifetime, and you know, we hear some of them that preach a life of everything's going to be prosperous, and everything's going to be easy, and you'll not be sick, and all that, and, and that's okay, but it's not biblical. I mean, it's okay if they want to preach that, I guess, but it's not biblical, because I can't find anybody who followed Jesus in the Bible that didn't have some battles and some uphill climb in their life, you know, it was never always a... A piece of cake for him. Ephesians said, "For we six twelve says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places." Second Corinthians ten four said, "For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds." So, what are our weapons then? If this is a spiritual battle. We need spiritual power to be able to fight in this battle. And uh, how do we acquire this power or what, what's the requirements to have it? So before I get into all this, let me say this. You can tell if I'm preaching in the Spirit or not. I can tell if I'm preaching in the Spirit or not. And I can tell you this, it's a lot easier for you to sit back there and say, well, there's no power in this message. There's no power in what he's saying or what he's preaching. It's a lot easier for you to do that than it is for you to tell me how do you get the power then that you need to do the job. It's easy to, for us to sit back and, and find fault, but it's not easy to tell someone how to get it. The book of Acts is a demonstration of the power of God in preaching and in the lives of the disciples. Acts 1.8 says, But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you'll be witness of me. And he went on to tell where all you'd be witnesses. But our job's to be witnesses here. Acts 4, 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them. What, what was the requirement? He was filled with the Holy Ghost. 4, 13 said, And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Amen. Acts 13, 52 said, And the disciples were continually, I like this, continually filled with joy. Yes. And with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to tell you something. How, how do we get that lifestyle? Do you want that lifestyle? Yes. Is there anybody here who would like to have a life filled with joy and filled with the Holy Spirit? Or would you rather just go on and be miserable your whole life and sit around and whine about all the bad things in your life and how rough, how you didn't get your fair treatment here or whatever? Because that's what kind of world we live in. If things don't go just right for somebody, it's always somebody else's fault. We don't want to take the blame, Randy, that we didn't get out of bed and go to work so we can't make our payments. <laughs> well, that got quiet. Let's move on. I wanted to give us a few requirements. And the first one is contrition of soul. Contrition is a state of being remorseful or being penitent. Being sorry for your sins, in other words. Do you know what? You cannot get saved this morning until you realize you're lost. If you think you're okay and you're going to do okay, the Bible says for the wages of sin is death, <laughs> but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He also says for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So that don't leave any of us out. We've all got things that we need to repent of and be sorry for. But that's the first requirement. Psalms 51, 17 said, The Lord is nigh to them that are of a broken heart and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. I'm going to tell you something this morning. When you really see God for who he is and you see yourself for who you are, it will bring repentance. I want to read you something real quickly here. Found in Isaiah chapter 6. And I'm going to read the first eight verses, I believe it is, of that. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died. Now this is Isaiah. 
He's a major prophet in the Old Testament, in case you didn't know that. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. His train filled the temple. You know what that meant? That meant his glory filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings, and with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then I said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched my lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. Can you see the difference that happened in Isaiah whenever he got a tongue off the altar and touched his lips and cleansed him and purged him from his unrighteousness? Every one of us this morning has got that same problem in our life. We need to be cleansed this morning from our unrighteousness. I'm going to tell you, Luke 18, in verses 9 through 14, was a story of two men praying. One was a sinner. One was a Pharisee. One was a publican and called himself a sinner. Now, the publican, as he sat down there to pray, he said, God, I thank you. I'm not like these other men, that I'm not like some of these other men out here, not even like this guy right here. And he pointed out that publican. But it said that that man couldn't even lift up his eyes toward heaven. But he smote himself on the chest and said, God, you know, forgive me. I'm a sinner. <laughs> forgive me. And he said, you know which one of them left there justified? The one that humbled himself before God. Psalm 23, 3 and 4 says, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. You're not going to get into heavenly places. You're not going to ascend into heavenly places until you have clean hands and a pure heart. What's that mean? I'm going to tell you something. Unconfessed sin is unforgiven sin. Our actions may sometimes fall short, but he talked about having a pure heart. Well, what's that mean? Does it mean having a pure heart mean you never do anything wrong? No, sir. There's not a person in this church that'll stand up here and tell you that they've never failed, that they've never sinned, that they've never done wrong. But I tell you how you keep a pure heart before God. The minute you do something wrong, you know the Bible says when we begin to walk after the Spirit, when we give our heart to Him, we're walking after the Spirit, not after the flesh. And the minute we do something wrong, His Holy Spirit will speak to your conscience He'll check you right there on the spot and let you know that what you just done, what you just said, wasn't right. <laughs> and he'll not leave you in the dark on that. And the best advice I can give you to keep a pure heart is the very minute you realize that you failed, you realize you said something or done something wrong, that you find a place to repent right then to him and ask him to forgive you and restore the joy of your salvation. <laughs> The second requirement is confession of sin. I think I just covered that, didn't I? In the 51st Psalm, David said, Have mercy on me, wash me, cleanse me, purge me, cast me not from thy presence, take not away thy Holy Spirit from me. I mean, here's a man that knew how to repent. Now, David, was, he was a guy that, he was a champion for the Lord. I mean, he stepped out and fought Goliath when none of the rest of them would, and he was just a boy. But he was also a man that was always falling, always getting himself in trouble. But what did he do? He would repent and go back to God. And he realized who God was. He's the one who was faithful, forgiving. I'm going to tell you something. The, the third thing is communion with God. God is the source of our power this morning. 
I wouldn't want to do this job. I couldn't do this job without him. Neither can Doug, neither can Caleb. And you can't live a Christian life without the power of God. You say, well, I, I don't think I can live that lifestyle. I don't think I can keep all those commandments and all those things. You're exactly right, you can't. But through his Holy Spirit behind you, giving you unction. You know the unction of the Holy Spirit, that's a word. Unction is a word. And we need it in our lives. I needed to preach the word. You needed to live a Christian life every day. You have to have the Holy Spirit in your life. And we realize this morning, he is our source of power. Now, if I'm going to speak for him, like I'm trying to do this morning, then I better speak to him somewhere down through the week. I'm going to tell you, we've got to prioritize our lives. God's got to be first in our life, above our families. Now, family's important, but I'm going to tell you, we've got to get our priorities straight. God better be number one in your life, and he may just test you to see if that's the case. He did Job. Job was an upright man, the Bible said. The Lord even kind of put him out there to the enemy, to old Satan and said, have you considered my servant Job, that he's an upright man? He even shunned evil completely. I mean, he wasn't like some of us that try to tiptoe around it all the time. No, he shunned evil and stayed away from it. But God tested him. He took everything that was important to him. He took all of his family he took his money, he left him his miserable wife there. I mean, oh, he left his wife there. That was her miserable comforter, maybe. She, she said, why don't you curse God and die? We got to start our day with the Lord. First Timothy 4, 6, Paul told Timothy, he said, take heed to thyself and unto the doctrine, continue in them, for doing this thou shalt save both thyself and them that hear thee. Acts 20, 28 this was speaking to the preachers at that time, said, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Brother Deb said this. He said, when we're up here behind the pulpit preaching, we're always preaching like this. You get that? He said it like this. He got one finger pointing at you and all the rest of them pointing back at me. And before we ever could get up here and preach a message in this pulpit, we got to preach it to ourselves at home. I got to see if I measure up to what I'm going to tell you. Because a lot of times in my life, the Lord spoke to me first before I ever spoke to you. <laughs> and I've had to get things right. He showed me where I failed. Now, we've been having great services. Would you agree with that? Yes. Been having great services. But would you agree with this? God's still not doing everything he wants to do here. The spirit comes and kind of goes sometimes in our service. Why is that? It's us. It's not him. It's us. But I asked God about this. It's been, it's been troubling me as your pastor because I haven't seen a victory like we should be seeing it around the altar. We should be seeing souls saved more than we are. And if you can come here in a lost state and sit in this service, and something that's said or done doesn't make you uncomfortable that you are lost, doesn't make you realize that you need a Savior, then there's something wrong with me or with what I'm doing here. So I began to ask God about that this week. What do we need? What do I need to do? And this is it. This is what he spoke to me. Let's get back to what I know to do. The preacher, I, as a preacher, I got to go to work. <laughs> I know that. You all got to go to work. I mean, I don't, I'm not a full-time minister. I still go to work to try to provide for my family. I understand you got to go to work, so you can't just shut your life down and spend your whole day reading the Word and all that. But let me tell you this. This is something God had showed me a long time ago, and I've kind of let up on it. And it's affecting me. So let me tell you what he showed me. I know you got to go to work. Get up 15 minutes earlier if that's what you got to do. And get with God. Put him first in your life. Get the word out. Read something in the word of God every morning. 
get on your knees before him and talk to him. And you know what? You don't have to be in a prone position to pray. You can be driving down the highway on your way to work and you can talk to God. But we need to have fellowship. We need to have communion with him because that's where the power comes from is communion with God. So what are the keys to communion? We need to discipline ourselves to read the Word. Our old deacon that used to sit right here on the front seat every week, he would tell us he tried to read 30 chapters every week. And he would challenge all of us to get the Word out. You try it. You read 30 chapters this week. Well, how many of us do that? If you do, you'll read the Bible through in about a year if you do that. But he challenged us all the time to read the Word. And he didn't get up just to try to shame you or to brag on what he had done because he done, but he knew what it would do for you if you stayed in the Word. I'm going to tell you something. There's all kinds of things out there that's fighting for our attention. And one of the worst things is that little phone that we get up and scroll through every morning, first thing we do, and look to see who said what about us <laughs> or whatever. I don't know what you're looking for. But anyway, we spend more time on that than we do the Word of God. And then we wonder why we don't have no power. Right there's your answer. Put that thing away and try getting out the Word or else read the Word on it. But he read 30 chapters a week. And you know the next thing we got to do is meditate on it throughout the day. You get up and read that, get that on your mind, and think about it throughout the day and see if your day don't go any better. And we can be in constant prayer. Bible says this. Pray without ceasing. What's that mean? That's what it means. Pray without ceasing. You can pray no matter what you're doing. You can be praying. I've thought about that a lot. And the older I get, when I've had to go back to cutting trees because I got a guy quit on me and don't have a timber cutter. So I went back to trying to cut trees. That's pretty hard on an old man. And you do a lot more praying at my age than I did when I was 25 trying to do that job. But I talked to God, and I can do that while I'm working. It was prayer that brought fire from heaven and consumed Elijah's sacrifice. It's great to bring your sacrifices. You know the, the Pharisee that I was talking about a while ago that was praying? He said, you know, I pay my tithes, and I, you know, I, I'm a, a man of God. I read your word, and, and uh, I pay my tithes. I go to church. I do all the right things. But yet, the sinner that said, I'm a sinner, was the one that left there with forgiveness. We got to stay in love with the Savior. Let us never forget the sacrifice He made for us. We ought to rehearse really every day of our life the day we got saved. I thought about that. The day I got saved, my, what a change God made in my life. I came up in the old church to an altar of prayer over on the end of the altar. And I had, to, I had been there that morning, and I didn't, I should have went that morning, and I didn't do it, Freddie. But I come back to church that night, and the Spirit was so strong, and He drawed me. His Holy Spirit drawed me. And I come to an altar of prayer. I was up on the end of the altar. And some of them, there's several, well, the whole church back then. It was different in them days. The whole church gathered around to pray when somebody went to the altar, not just two or three. So the whole church really was gathered around up there, but there's a few close to me that was pounding on me and beating on me and, and praying with me. And they're saying, some of them were saying, give up, give up. And there's some of them saying, hold on, hold on. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I really... They were confusing if I listened to them. But when it all got quiet and it was just the Holy Spirit speaking to me, it was just like God opened up the windows of heaven <laughs> and he dumped down a, a bucket of honey over me, Freddie, that just seemed like it just ran down over my head. And it made a change in the boy that I was. I didn't no longer struggle to live for him. I mean, it was a joy for me to be able to come to the house of God. And I couldn't wait till the doors got open. And we didn't just go to church here, but if that's happened revival somewhere else, I'd try to go there too, Freddie, because I want to be in the house of God. And I tell you, you get a good dose of salvation, we won't have to coax you to get you to the house of God. You'll want to be there. 
We got to stay in love with the Savior. We need to make the most of our public worship. Now, there's two kinds of worship. You know, there's public worship and there's your private worship. This is public worship. You're in the house of God with a group of other people, of believers, who are here for the same purpose, I think, is to lift up God and to worship Him and to look to Him for help in our services and all that. But I'm telling you, I want you to quit being spectators and be a participant in this thing. How about that? It's tough. Let me tell you something. I've been on ball teams when I was a starter and I got to play the whole game. And you know, if we win, I felt really great when we won the game. If we lost, I was really sad if we lost the game. But I've also been a bench warmer, Monty. <laughs> and you know what? I really didn't care if we won or lost because didn't, I didn't do anything to contribute and I didn't do anything to cause us to lose. It's really hard to get excited about something if you're a set spectator sitting on the sideline and not taking any part in what's going on. So if you're not excited about church this morning, how about getting involved with what's going on, quit being a spectator, and be part of what's going on in this service this morning. We gotta get in the game. <laughs> get in the game this morning. I'll tell you what, this is one place I don't want any bench warmers in my church. I want everybody to be in the game. <laughs> you got the same opportunity as the guy beside you to be a starter this morning. Thank God. Then we need private worship. Let me just suggest something to you about privately worshiping God. You just wake up in the morning and start thanking Him. Now, I know life's not perfect. I know every one of us has got battles that we face. I know we have needs in our life. I know all that. But the first thing I'd like for you to do when you wake up tomorrow morning is just start thanking God for what you do have, for the good things in your life, for what health that you do have, for the job that you have, for the home that you have, the roof over your head. Start thanking Him for the good things. And I'll guarantee you, you want to find out how to worship Him? There's a good way to start it. Just starting by being thankful for what he's done for you. And I'll promise you this, it won't be long. If you lift him up, he'll lift you up. <laughs> I'll guarantee you that. I'm going to shut it down. But I want to tell you this morning, I, I thought God ordered this service. He did. My wife taught a wonderful lesson back in our classroom back there. And she was excited about what she was teaching, too, by the way. But I'm going to tell you something. God has ordered this thing for you to get help this morning. There's some have came. We've had some good prayers. I believe prayers have been answered here this morning. The power of God is here. And if you've got a need in your life, don't go back home the way you came. Don't drag out another week with the enemy on your back, whispering in your ear, telling you all the things that's wrong and all the things you can't do and how that you're not enough and you can't do that. You don't have any power with God. I'm telling you how to get it this morning. Let's stand to our feet if you would. I believe most of us this morning could probably come to the altar and pray. Now, I have been praying about these things, and God showed me what to do, but I ain't too good to go to an altar of prayer and ask Him to help me with it either down through this week. But if we got too much pride to do that, then we'll probably go back home the way we are. But let's just bow our heads just for a few moments. If you're here and you felt that little nagging at your heart this morning that you know you're right. I don't have the power I should have. I haven't been committing the time to God. I haven't been committing myself to God like I should. And I need some help this morning from Him. Would you want to step out and let the church pray with you this morning?